So we're going to start doing Lexio Divina, let us say, meaning reading the scripture, uh, reading a book of scripture, in, in with great dependence on the Holy Spirit, in an attitude of listening and receptivity and in sensitivity to the action of the Spirit on our various faculties, so that if we feel called to reflect, we do it. If we feel called to make prayer, we do that. If we feel called to do nothing, but just to rest and, and in the presence of the one who has spoke these words or who, who is present in the text, fine. And we move freely back and forth, depending on the force of the attraction of grace. And you make lots of mistakes, but how else does human beings learn anything? Uh, so the first principle that I've already enunciated would be to start with prayer to the Holy Spirit, remembering that the Spirit is within us and, and uh, is the guide to all the truth, as Jesus said in the Gospel of John, and that uh, we don't have to go any place to find the Holy Spirit except to open to that presence within us. However you want to do that. It could be a brief prayer. It could just be sitting for a few moments. There's a great deal of, of, of spontaneity and creativity that is useful for the contemplative life. If you want to destroy the contemplative life, just put it into a straitjacket, as certain lifestyles have tried to do in, in, in uh, church history and have, have taken uh, an immense work of reform to, to fix again. Then, if you're reading the Old Testament, read Christ into it as the fathers did. And that means that, that every event in the Old Testament that has a symbolic force, not everything in the New Testament has, refers to the coming of Christ. It's a preview of the grace of Christ, which is the fullness of grace. So that means that grace is present in these Old Testament characters and what they've done. Then read the New Testament as if reading your own experience of grace into the text so that you're alert to the fact that this text is talking about you on some level and your experience of life and of grace. Thus, in this way, the, the, the scripture or the, the parables of Jesus and his wisdom sayings and the main events of his life, especially his passion, death, and resurrection, become mirrors in which you see your own uh, life's experience of grace reflected back to you so that you, 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 you know what it's like to feel like Peter at the betrayal of Jesus. Y you know what it's like uh, to be on Mount Tabor and to have to come down. You, you'd, you know what it's like to look at the cross and think that everything is lost. You know what it's like to see Jesus' message apparently torn to shreds and, and destroyed and, uh, and his faithful followers running away. In other words, the, the Spirit speaks to your experience with the same grace that is present in the Old Testament by anticipation, is fully present in Christ's historical life, has been preserved in the sacraments, and is present in the Christian community, as pr Jesus promised, and is now being offered to you as you deepen your relationship with Christ through lexio and centering prayer and contemplation. In other words, this grace belongs to you, and the scriptures are talking about it, and they're talking about you. And, and, and this makes the scriptures begin to come alive and to direct our, our movement uh, prudently by having the word of God to encourage or to correct some of our points of view, as the case may be. Now, a spiritual director at this point has to keep you on that path and not interfere with his or her own ideas or what books they like and other nonsense. You, you have to follow uh, your own inspiration and the, the, the spiritual guide, a soulmate, helps 
you to be faithful to what you feel you should be be doing and, and uh, to point out when you're getting off the path if necessary. But the inspiration of what you should do comes from the spirit, not a human director, at least most of the time. The third principle I think is worth keeping in mind is that the word of God is addressed to different levels of our being, imagination, memory, our, our will, our decision-making apparatus, and our reflective apparatus, and our intuitive faculties. When the spirit begins to move towards addressing our intuitive faculties, then the others get dried out, and then you have something like the night of sense or a feeling that God has withdrawn from you. Not at all. He just went downstairs, so to speak, to cultivate a, a faculty that would bring about a closer relationship with him. And that means leaving the superficial faculties, of memory, imagination, and rationalizing, they get left behind. So they get bored and in prayer, and they look around for something to do. And if there's nothing to do, then they just feel sorry for themselves and moan and grown and give you a hard time. You just ignore them all because they, it, the God can't possibly uh, leave us. But it, it's a great help to realize that there's some method to his madness and that if we feel abandoned, it's only our superficial faculties that are feeling it. He hasn't gone anywhere. He's calling us to a deeper union and relationship or communion with him. And you just have to sit it out until that becomes apparent and the faculties calm down their noisy complaints, and, and, uh, and, and you have peace enough to hear the word of God, which is always brings peace when you're hearing it fully. The fourth uh, principle, it seems to me, uh, I've already uh, mentioned in some degree, to read your experience of grace into the Gospels, and the Gospels to see them as parables of grace. That's the way the liturgy treats the gospel. The readings at, at Mass and the liturgy are not so much for information, but are parables of grace. And uh, you see that especially in, uh, at the time of Epiphany, which is a, which is a magnificent instruction in, in how to do Lectio Divina as a dynamic process. So, so Lectio really has, has used the liturgy as its basic inspiration or just listening to the uh, word of God produces this kind of inspiration uh, spontaneously. But if you'll notice in the great feast of the Epiphany that we just celebrated, uh, you have a complete disregard for the continuity of events in history. Epiphany is a triptych that has as its major title the revelation of God. And then you have three different pictures, historically distinct by years, but which are all put together in order to communicate to you and to us and to the church what the meaning of those events were from the perspective of grace for the church. And since you're the church or you're living now in perspective of what, what, how you should look at, at the mystery of the epiphany. It's, a, it's, a, it's the revelation of God's presence. So first you get the magi revelation of God uh, to the Gentiles. That's the historical event. Then in the same feast, at least in the hymns, although some of the changes in the liturgy have, have destroyed this continuity, so you can't see it as well as we used to before the, some liturgical changes. Of, it was a sin to take away the octave of epiphany. That's just a personal view. In any case, the next big event is the baptism of Jesus. That's 34 years later or whenever. And, and this is the revelation of Jesus as God to the Jews of his time. And then you leap ahead a few more years, and you come to the marriage feast of Cana, not celebrated the next Sunday. I guess you had it last Sunday, didn't you? And, and, the, and here, the, here the message, of course, is the revelation of Jesus as God to the apostles. And then you go to communion, and, the, and, and by then you're thoroughly prepared. And this is a revelation 
of, of Christ as God to you in particular, and you enter into divine union, which all the other revelations were a preparation for. So Epiphany becomes the feast of the mystical body of Christ, the feast of divine life in which you're opened to the coming of God in ever-increasing and deepening levels of your awareness until that awareness moves into pure awareness and union and, and unity. And, and, and this, is, this is what the Christian religion is all about, as far as I can see it. it, it but now let's, let's ask the question, and this, this might be a help to you in Lexio. Once you've identified grace as working in the Old Testament, fully in the new, and, and now appropriated and offered to you in the sacraments and in contemplative prayer and in the Christian community, right now on a day-to-day -day basis, 24 hours a day, it's right there. All of grace is right at our fingertips. And the liturgy and our lectio is simply uh, telling us the symbols that reinforce our experience so that what we know by experience is confirmed by Scripture. And what is uh, taught us in Scripture is awakens the most important mystery about us, which is the divine indwelling. It, uh, the external word awakens the interior word, and you begin to know the different levels in which you're relating to God. And, and this knowing, then, which is not intellectual, but the knowing of the heart and through love, keeps on expanding and keeps on embracing all of life and, and, and transforming not only us but our relationships. And each time we move to a new level of faith, it takes time to work that, that enlightenment into, into that particular level of our faculty. So, uh, so the spiritual life does take a little time, and it, I recommend that you start soon <laughs> or start young. But as I always say, if you are a little late in starting, there is an accelerated course for those over 75. <laughs> if you live to be 75. One of the other principles I'd like to mention is that our interpretation of Scripture or our insight into a particular text that applies to us today is, of course, not the last word because others may be getting another interpretation that's suitable for them, or you're only interpreting it from the level of, of whichever one of these R's are predominant in your spiritual life at this time. So what you get out of the same story, uh, you know, 10 years ago, is not going to be the same that you get today. And, and so the, the scriptures are inexhaustible, especially certain parts of them, like the the parables, no one will ever, uh, will ever plumb them to their depth, and there's always some new meaning that keeps emerging. And uh, similarly, the wisdom sayings of the Lord. And I'm going to just quote uh, one of my favorite sayings, which, which has to deal with, with the stages of Lectio uh, beyond those that we, we're looking at here this week. Uh, the Word of God, of course, is, is the eternal Son of God in the bosom of the Father. The Word has become flesh, and that Word is the source of all that exists, as we know, the universe, and, uh, and uh, all its contents and all its consciousness. So, so, so what is the basic thrust of, of the Gospel or Lectio, which is a way of assimilating the Gospel and of being assimilated to it. So, so the great lights that we might have in Lectio are, are for today, and they, uh, we may move on to others tomorrow, and, and hopefully we'll continue to grow because uh, the Spirit in us begins to see our lives and the Gospel from, uh, from an ever clearer perspective as the obstacles, like the false self puts up, begin to diminish, then the light of the Spirit. And, and here again, the liturgy is a guide to our understanding of how Lexio affects us. Because we start out, so to speak, with Advent, the theological uh, 
meaning of Advent is, is light or enlightenment, especially on the fact that, that the Word has become incarnate. And Epiphany emphasizes this by showing certain other revelations in which the Word has manifested himself not just as in the world, but united to the Church, uh, which is the meaning of, of, of Epiphany. And, and united to everyone who is in the mystical body of the church, which is you and I. So Epiphany is really the celebration of, of Christian enlightenment as, as, as an expression of the word of God or a continuation of the divine word in you and my particular humanity in our time and place, inviting us to be the word of God to the people we know and love in our area, or in our profession, in our work. That's why I said there's a divine way of being anything that's, that's basically good. A hobo is a divine way of being that. In fact, there is a saint who was one, Joseph Labra, wasn't it? Benedict Joseph Labra. So, so there's a way of being poor, a way of being bit rich that is, that is really the the movement of the spirit overcoming our false self, purifying it so that the true self, which is God's manifestation in us, begins to manifest not us as <laughs> with our illusion of who we are, but to manifest us as who we actually are, as, a, as the expression of the divine goodness and tenderness and, and love of God for the world, for our humanity for all creation. Uh, so the fifth stage of Lexio <laughs> <laughs> is when you no longer have to listen to the word because you are the word. Now let me explain that a little bit. Um, that I would call unity with the word, or unity listening, or consciousness, so that you no longer listen to the word, but are the word and manifesting the word of God in daily life, and are transmitting it insofar as it has taken possession of you in your daily life. This is when other people uh, are drawn to you. I, uh, there's one century for a lady that, that teaches biology in some university. Has nothing to do with religion, but her, her office is constantly being assaulted by young people who are coming to get counseling from her. Now, why are they doing that? Because they sense that she is living the answers that they're asking, and she may not be able to explain it to them. So uh, explanation is, is, is the is the least communication of the Word of God. The real communication is to be or become the Word of God in your very being, and that is the triumph of the infinite grace. And we might call that the fifth stage of Lexio, when <laughs> you are or have become uh, God's Word in your particular human situation with all its circumstances, suffering or joy or whatever, and the people you know and love and work for or are professionally attached to. So that in you walking around <laughs> the world or going anywhere or doing anything, you're constantly pouring into the world the divine energy wherever you are. And whoever is on that wavelength will begin to receive it or be touched by it. And, and, and this is, the, it seems to me, the, the, the crowning fruit of, of transformation into the Word of God and, uh, and, and the joy of being no self. Now, Jesus has this wonderful saying that I offer as a, as a, as a final thought here, and, and, uh, a f a f and my own lexio on this, this uh, phrase might, might be of help to you, or at least an example of, of, of moving through those stages of of, of assimilating the word. Jesus has this fascinating saying which uh, in Matthew 10, I believe it is, uh, 
he who seek only himself, we could include our spiritual aspirations here, will bring himself to ruin. But he who brings himself to nothing will find out who he is. Now let's put that in the feminine in case some of you say, well, that's for men. Uh, she who, who, who seeks only herself will bring herself to ruin. But she who brings herself to nothing will find out who she is. Now this suggests that we do not know who we are, really are, that we have an image of ourselves, a self-image that changes and develops, and that we tend to fossilize on some illusory identity, such as we over-identify with our feelings. Nothing wrong with feelings, you need to face them. But to over-identify leads to acting out in a way that's destructive under many circumstances. N we also over-identify with the cultural conditioning out of which we emerge, so that we say we're an Irishman, or we're, we're a Catholic, or we're a lawyer, or we're a parent, or a grandparent. You are not a grandparent or a parent. You ha may have children, you may have begotten children, but you are not identified with this child because the true you has no identity except uh, what God has given you, and you don't know what that is. You only find out by not being anything anymore. And so our over-identification with the emotions is the work to dismantle the false self. Our over-identification with our cultural conditioning, we belong to this family, with this ethnic group, with this religion, that has to be dismembered in order to become nothing. And so uh, the last thing that has to be disidentified with is even more difficult. It's the de-rolling process in which who we think we are begins to vanish or is disintegrated or is clobbered by circumstances so that you can't be that anymore. And so life tends to accompany this spiritual movement so that if you don't get this idea in, in adolescence, which few do, or, or in early adulthood, or in the midlife crisis, which makes us question some of the things we thought with, with all our energy. It's not that the, the, the good things that God has created, <laughs> that they're not good, it's that the over-identification with them makes them into gods or substitutes for the true happiness which emerges when we accept ourselves or bring ourselves to no thing, when we're no longer anything. As an example, to become a true monk, you have to be willing not to be a monk. When you no longer care about being a parent for selfish reasons, you're the perfect parent. In other words, it's in letting go of the exaggeration, which we've over-identified with, that enables us to be fulfill whatever our role is. So I am not a priest, though I have that role. I am nothing, you might say, who is exercising the role of priest temporarily, similarly as a monk. Similarly, all of you. So, so the word of God challenges who we think we are. So it's not just a movement of grace into us, as I've been speaking about up till now, but a relinquishing and self-surrender of our false selves with our false identities, which prevents grace from enabling us completely to be transformed into Christ and to be who we really are. And that turns out to be unconditional love, because that's who God is, 
and whoever is no thing or nothing is prepared to manifest God in the fullest possible way. So we have to be a little cautious of our aspirations in the spiritual world to be a great contemplative, a great spiritual director, a great abbot, a great bishop, a great anything you, you might want to be. Canonized. Maybe you want to be canonized. <laughs> All I know is it costs a lot of money. <laughs> Better leave some in your will for this purpose. But to let it all go, that's what I'm saying. That's what the word of God is saying. Let, you, let me be God in you. And as St. Catherine of Siena said, there is no me but God. And, and, and this is the final, it seems to me, this is supposed to be the crown, <laughs> completion of the Lexio Divina process is we move beyond the levels of rest to beyond experience of anything. Because God is not in anything, in any concept, feeling, or experience. But God is totally present to us. And, and this is when he addresses us at the fullest level of our being, not just at the lower levels, but addresses us as he addressed Moses face to face. That means being to being with nothing in between in the way of a false self, illusion. I suggest that this is a considerable project <laughs> <laughs> that only God could have thought it up. But that seems to be what God is inviting us to in the gospel and is providing us with all the means that you need to get there. It's the wise balancing of means that enables this extraordinary project of becoming divine, divinization, it's a great tradition in the Eastern Church and the Eastern Fathers, which meant not just becoming a better human being, but becoming godlike or God not in the ontological sense, which would be contrary to theology, but in the practical, experiential, existential sense of, of forgetting oneself and oneself as a fixed point of reference ceases because that reference point is constantly changing and being transformed in, from, as Paul says, from glory to glory. As, as we penetrate and are penetrated by the divine life itself. So it's the inner life of the Trinity, of, of unconditional love, that is communicated to us by the word of God in the degree that we're prepared to hear it, and beyond that, in the degree that we're prepared to become it. So I recommend uh, picking up scriptures occasionally and <laughs> doing a little Lexio. And our centering prayer is what moves Lexio if you're a little bit stuck on your faculties, and using your mind in order to go to God, or, or overactive and feel you have to do something to pray. Centering prayer is focused on overcoming that obstacle, which is significant in our time, in order to completely open, surrender. Consent is not an effort. Surrender is not an effort. And transformation is something only God can do. So from that perspective, it should be easy. <laughs> so my heartfelt prayer for each of you is keep going <laughs> and have invincible confidence that this is God's work in you, and, and not to be afraid to ask that what he has begun in you might be completed. Blessings.